Beloved, I want to invite you today to listen in with a keen ear and an open heart as Dr. Chris Green and I take a look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, at a very specific portion where Jesus begins to share with the disciples about his suffering and his impending death. And there's a lesson to be learned in the life of Peter. There's an old saying, but for the grace of God, there go I. I'm not sure we always are aware of the capabilities and potentialities for evil that are within us. But in a season when God is calling us to humble ourselves and reflect and live a lifestyle of repentance, I think it's important that we approach with sober spirit and with great desire to be taught and formed into the shape of Christ, to hear those things that require our yieldedness and our surrender because but for the grace of God, we could end up in a whole lot of troubling places. But God's mercy and grace is such that he enables us, if we pay attention and if we abide in him, to overcome those things that want to overcome us. Dr. Chris, when, um, when Jesus begins to talk about his suffering, it's post a very powerful moment where Peter confesses, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, right. and as the story unfolds, it gets marked now, this is Peter's account to Mark, so you, 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 you want to, I mean, we want to appreciate that Peter's being very transparent here. Absolutely. And, and is inviting us into the interiority of his own life at that point. Talk a little bit about this. I think that's, that's a wonder that's so obvious that we overlook it, and that is Scripture does not dress up any of its characters. It doesn't hide the flaws of any of its characters. I mean, this is... It's, it's really remarkable when you think about it. Samuel Wells has a wonderful book on this. He talks about the difference between heroes and saints. And he says, what scripture gives us is the stories of men and women becoming saints in all of their brokenness. What we would probably have wanted, what we would probably have made for ourselves is a story of heroes. Yeah. Right. A stories, stories of superheroes even. Uh, people who rise above humanity as you and I know it. But that's not what Scripture gives us. And Peter is, in many ways, the most exemplary saint in the New Testament. He's the one who we get to watch him as he gets everything wrong, <laughs> right? And he lets us see that about him. I think it's, it's a really remarkable thing. And when you think about the possibility that he's nudging Mark in terms of how to write that story, his willingness to say, listen, tell us, tell it plainly. You know, don't, don't hide where I failed. I mean, I, I think that's a sign of remarkable holiness that he doesn't try to make himself look holy. He doesn't yeah, present yeah, himself yeah, yeah. as saintly. That's how we know he is saintly, right? But there's a, there's, and there's this, this kind of counterintuitive aspect to this that the more scripture kind of lets us see the humanity of these, these men and women, the more we're able to see how transformed they have been by God, precisely because they're not defending themselves, right? So in, before I come back to the story of Peter, in, in Corinthians, Paul talks about the Moses story in the veil. We've discussed this before, about how Paul reads that story differently, right? So if you just go back and read the text on its own, it looks like Moses puts on the veil because he's trying to protect the people, right? His face is glowing and they're intimidated. But Paul says that's not what's actually going on. What's actually going on is the glory is fading off of Moses' face, and he doesn't want them to see the glory fade. So he puts a veil in his face, not because he's too bright to see, for them to see, but because he's afraid they'll see that the brightness fades off of him. Now, that's either because he's trying to protect his own image. He doesn't want them to know. Or protecting God's image. Well, and that's what I think it is, yeah, ultimately. Yeah, protecting God's image. That it's image. not so much that Moses is afraid that they'll see he's human. He's afraid they'll think God isn't faithful if the glory fades. And so he, he, he masks himself. And Paul says that veil is still on us. That when, when the men and women we look to veil themselves to protect themselves or God, we're the ones who end up veiled. Right? Wow. And so what scripture gives us is unveiled men and women. Abraham and Sarah, we hear the story of her laughing and him laughing. That we, the story of Peter and Mary, Magdalene, and so on. Scripture keeps giving us this. And no more so than in this scene you've brought up, right? Where in Mark's gospel, there's a secret that's kept all the way through the first eight chapters. And the that Messianic, secret is who Jesus he is. is. The he is. He is son of God. 
And then Jesus finally, the middle, what will become the middle of the gospel, puts the point to them. Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says, you are Messiah. You are the son of God. And in Matthew's gospel, we're told that Jesus praises him for it. You have spoken truly. That's revealed to you by the father. This is not from flesh and blood. And calls him Peter and on, on you I'll build the church. But in Mark's gospel, we don't get those details. All we get is Jesus asks, who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the son of God. And the gospel turns. And from that point, it says, and Jesus began to speak to them openly about the things he has to suffer, which tells you that the secret is not just who he is, but that who he is is revealed in his suffering. So Profound. the secret is now open. And the moment he does that, Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. And that, that line, I think, is the telling one. Peter took him aside and rebuked him. Peter, as long as the secret was kept, Jesus was what Peter imagined him to be. But the moment God revealed who Jesus was as he is in himself, not as Peter imagined him to be, but as he is, then everything in Peter came apart. And he has to control what so Jesus So because it came do. apart in him... He tries to take Jesus apart. And I think that's what that line means, right? That he took Jesus aside. So you, you could also translate that, and some, some do. He took Jesus apart. And I think that's what he's doing, right? He's trying to find a side of Jesus that he can use to get his way. Because he's coming apart. He's coming, in, he's broken into pieces by the thought of this Messiah suffering. That's not how it's supposed to work. And so he's coming apart as you said. And so he's trying to take Jesus apart, trying to find an aspect of Jesus that he can use. And this is, of course, impossible because God is whole. God is one. Right. I mean, the, the theological term simple. for it is God is simple. God is simple. Which I love the ways in which in English, when we say, say someone is simple, it's an insult. But because of God's humility, it's something he gladly welcomes, right? God, God has no sides, that There's he, no he shadow of turning. That's the language of scripture, right? That he 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 doesn't you know wake up sometimes happy and sometimes sad, or he doesn't have a, a good side and a bad side. He doesn't favor you over me. When we say he's no respecter of persons, that, that's what we're saying. There are no sides to God. You can't find an angle to use. You with know God. what's interesting about that? I remember back in the early days that there was a fringe movement within the latter rain. And I, I have deep love for the latter rain history. Um, some of my greatest influence came from latter rain mm. voices, but there was a, a group of them that went off yeah. and they would talk about the fact the only way they could reconcile evil was that God had a dark side Yeah, in total yep. disregard for the fact that there's no shadow of turning in him. Yep. God is light in him. There is no darkness. Yep. They would, they would all of a sudden philosophize that God had a dark side. Yeah. It's all projection. It's it, all it's all personal projection. Two things are happening there. One is exactly that. We project our dark side onto God. Right. The other is we assume that God is whatever it makes happen, what we can't explain. So go there. Go when, there. When bad things are happening, in in order to satisfy our own sense of control, we need God to somehow be doing that. So which is still projection. Yeah. But it's a projection of control. And I, I think this is where I think when most people say God, when they say God, what they mean is not at all what Christians are supposed to mean when we right. say God. What they actually mean is whatever it is that's making happen, the stuff I can't explain. Right? It's the force, the invisible force that's controlling the stuff I can't control. And that's just utterly unfaithful to what Scripture reveals about, about who God is. But one of the tragedies in our, our tradition is early on, in, the, in those formative years of the charismatic movement, there were people who were deeply formed in other traditions who have an experience of God that opens them up in prayer and mission to the gifts of the Spirit in ways that they could never have imagined possible. And they ministered from that place. They had deep formation in scripture, deep formation in theology. And then they have an experience of God that opens them up to new ways of practicing ministry. But as time passes and we go from generation to generation, what we pass on to our children is not that deep formation, but a love for doing ministry a certain way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what happens is we're passing on things that are critical 
but they only work if they're deeply rooted, if they're founded in a deep understanding of who God is, his nature and his character, and a deep understanding of the whole of scripture. You know, the whole, what the saints called, the old saints called the whole counsel of God. Mm -hmm. And what we ended up doing was passing on techniques. Yeah. Instead of passing on this deep spiritual formation. And now we're starting to reap the harvest of that, the bad harvest of what happens over generations when people hear less and less and less about God. I mean, I, I think I had this realization when I was a young pastor that I had been raised in a church that talked about the stuff God does for us all the time. But I don't know that I ever heard people say anything much about who God is. I didn't hear a sermon on the Trinity or, or what it means to talk about God as eternal or infinite or, or holy other than because God is holy, we're not supposed to do certain things, right? right? But there was no deep understanding of the mystery of God or or the wonder of God, the awe that, that should be inspired in us by our reflection of, of God's nature and character. And I think the the long-term consequences of that are tragic, you know, because you we're talking about a God we no longer know. I think we're we're in the exact opposite position of Paul on Mars Hill, right? So Paul's on Mars Hill and he says, Oh, I see you've got this altar to this God you don't know. God, Let me tell you God. about him, right? We think we know this God. We've got altars to a God we know, but we don't really know at all. And so we, we're so familiarized, we can't, we don't know what we don't know. We don't realize what we don't understand about this God we are speaking of. We know his name, but we've forgotten his character and we've forgotten his nature. And somehow we have to turn that conversation for our kids' sake and, and for the sake of the church's future. So Peter takes him aside, takes him apart, takes him or apart. is endeavoring to pick him yeah. to pieces Absolutely. so that he can find something in him that's like him. Absolutely. Something and, he can use. And, and Jesus roundly rebukes him. Absolutely. And, and, there's this, and I, I don't even know all of what to make of this, so I'd love to hear what you think about this. But I just this week noticed something in that passage in Mark that I've never noticed before. And that is when, when that happens, when, when Peter takes Jesus apart... When Jesus rebukes him, and they rebuke each other. So Peter first rebukes him, and right. Jesus is like, hold on. <laughs> he, he, he rebukes him. But there's a detail in Mark in which it says, and he looked at the other disciples and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. So he's actually saying this, not just to Peter. He's giving them a warning. He's he, teaching them what the satanic is all about. I think that's what's happening, is that he's naming three realities at once. He's speaking to Peter looking at them, addressing Satan, right? Get behind me, Satan. Because it's, it's the interaction between Peter and those apostles that concerns him. What is Satan going to do? How is Satan going to use Peter and these apostles against each other to interfere with the mission? And so he has to root out the evil that's between Peter and those disciples. And I, I think that's why he speaks to Peter while looking at them and addresses Satan. So Father John Baer would say that the work of the satanic is to separate Christ from the cross. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a way of explaining that and contrasting the satanic and the demonic, though they're part of the whole sure. horde of hell and the powers Absolutely. of darkness. But there, I would argue that even C.S. Lewis lent that lent, was lent to that kind of a posture as well. Talk us through from get thee behind me, Satan, to Jesus casting out demons. How does all of that, how do we need to discern that and understand that? Yeah, so I think evil, it works in two ways. One is what I'm calling the demonic. And I'm not married to these terms. I mean, I think you could use different language for it, but just for the sake of conversation, I think the demonic refers to evil in its forms of chaos, destruction, and darkness. So it's, it's, a, it's evil as it threatens the integrity of our lives, right? It's legion, you know, right. who's in the tombs, right. breaking chains, cutting himself. The evil as, as that which terrifies us, right? The, 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 the nightmares, right. the, you know, the sense of the monsters in the deep. But that's really not where evil's power lies. Evil's power lies in its deceptive dimensions, in what Paul calls Satan's appearance as an angel, angel of the light. light. So what evil does, I think, and I think this is almost always evil's tactic, 
is to present us with darkness, chaos, and destruction, to frighten us, and then present us with false light and false order, something that will secure us against that darkness, but is actually false. And going to enslave us only further to exactly. it. Exactly. So if you go to the Legion story, Legion is kept outside the city in the tombs. Right. He's isolated. Right. The satanic has control of the city. Right. The demonic is in the borderlands outside the city. When Jesus comes, he can get to Legion. Right? Now he can speak life to Legion. But it's the people in the city who throw Jesus out. Yeah, they're terrified. They're more afraid of Jesus than they are of the than they are of Legion. Because here's the thing about sin. Even though we're afraid of the darkness, we're more afraid of the true light than we are of the darkness. And that's why Jesus ends up on a cross. I mean, that's, that's why the prophets end up dead in Jerusalem, is that they're speaking true light. And false order wants stability and security against this darkness, but it doesn't want to be open to the light of God. And I think that's why Jesus dies between two thieves. And Fulton Sheen, who was an old Roman yeah, Catholic TV uh, evangelist, yeah, I mean, just astonishing. He preached in a cape. He which did. I wish I, yeah, I wish had, I had. And he had his hat on. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but I heard him preach once about this very point, although he didn't use the language I'm using. And he said, never forget that Jesus is killed between two thieves because the people in power can't tell the difference between the kingdom of God and the people who upset their order. Right? That Jesus is the prophet of a kingdom, not of this world. And the people who are in power are just as threatened by that as they are by thieves and robbers and insurrectionists. And that, I think we, we've turned Jesus into the one who gives us that order. Yeah, yeah, rather yeah. Rather than the one who comes to yeah, expose it to and expose deliver us from it. Absolutely. Um, what are the implications for that in our own hearts? Well, I think first is to realize that is what's happening in us, whether we realize it or not. And there's no need to hide from it, to hide it from ourselves or to hide it from other people. I mean, that's the irony here. The more, if we want to be saints, the only way to become a saint is to own the ways in which sin is still at work in your life and the brokenness that sin has left. It's, made, it's not always sin, but the consequences of sin, the results of sin. Our generation was groomed in you are the righteousness of God in yeah. Christ. Yeah. Uh, you stand complete by faith in him. And there's a tr there's truth to that. Yeah. But this other side was sorely neglected. Now, I personally, from, from the earliest recollections I have of my encounter with Christ and my Pentecostal experience, for whatever reason... Um, I have loved knowing that I've been delivered and that I am in Christ righteous, but I have also been constantly reminded that I'm also at the same time a saint and a sinner. Absolutely. So there's a paradox in me. Yeah. And I have prayed the sinners, and the, I've prayed blind Bartimaeus' prayer for as long as mm. I can remember. It's, I realize it's part of the tradition of the church. Right. But it became part of Sharona's tradition from very early on. It has become, I don't pray any prayer at some point without saying, Lord Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah. That, that's, it's, it's deeply ingrained in me. I'm not condemned by that. I'm not feeling belittled by that. But I am profoundly aware that when Peter takes Jesus aside... That potential is in me, even yeah, today, yeah, that potential, because I'm offended when I'm threatened to the point of death. Absolutely. However the death of the cross is going to work its way out, yeah. there's a part of me that That's says... Yeah. The cross okay. is offensive, even for yeah. those of us who've given our lives to it. Yeah. I mean, it's... One is, I, I, for some reason, we're not good holding more than one thought in our heads at the same time, right? So, But the fact is, Scripture does... And it, it, all of that is true. I mean, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. You know, we, we have been made one with him. Yeah. You know, he, God dwells in us and we dwell in God. And it is also true that that needs to be said of us over and over and over again because the struggle is still playing right. out. It's already true. It's already true in a way for which we hope, right? So Paul says in Romans 8, we are saved in hope and 
Hope is not hope if it's if seen. If it's seen, right. Right. So our salvation, this is one of the ways. So if you go like to Romans 10, Paul says, now is your salvation nearer than when you believed. So if, if I have salvation at the moment, I believe, what sense does that sentence even make? Right. Jesus says, those that endure to the end shall, shall be, be saved. saved. Right. Peter says, your salvation is kept in heaven for you. Reserved. Yeah. And, and, on, and on and on and on. What scripture says is you are saved in Christ. He's already accomplished that. That's already true. But you are being brought up into participation in that. So what's already true of you in Christ is becoming true of you. So Hebrews 2 quotes Psalm 8, talks about how God has put all things under our feet. He's, he's given us dominion. And then he says, but we do not see that yet. Right. What we see is, is Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So he says, we look to Jesus who's authored and finished our faith. So we're still living it. He's finished it. And because he's finished it, we know we will too, right? He's the forerunner who's going to bring us to the same end he's already reached. But it's not over for us yet. And it's not over for us. And this is why in, in, in 11, he will say, they, even the dead, are not perfected without us. Talk about that. that our, our lives are so bound up together that even the saints who die and go on to heaven, go on to their reward, they're not yet brought to fullness. That, and that their intercession for us they're praying for us with Christ is a praying for us to finish the race because it's not over until it's over for all of us. Right. And we, we haven't, we haven't been able to, to continue to teach that. It's like we can, for whatever reason, we're like piano players that can only hit one note at a time. But that's not how you make music. right? I mean, you're going to have to hit more than one note at the same time. And that, I think, is what we need to recover when we're reading Scripture and we're discipling people and teaching them about the faith. It is true. I mean, hit this note about righteousness. Hit this note about belovedness. All that's true. There's nothing wrong with that. But make sure you also hit the note about, you know, you don't, Paul is saying, I might become a castaway, right? I am the chief of sinners. Of sinners, yeah. Right? Uh, Stanley Harwas, who was retired from Duke, professor Duke there, he has this saying about sin. He says, you know you are in a bad place when you think you know sin naturally and Jesus is just what you need to get rid of that feeling. He says, actually, you don't know sin until you've been delivered from it. He's like, part of sin is, is it's keeping you from knowing it until Jesus has delivered you from it. And so another way of saying that is nothing is more sinful than what we've said about our sin. And we, we need Profound. to come back to Sanctification, come back to the process of being made like Christ, th the time God takes to form us, and, and to realize that all of this can be true at the same time. It's true in the same way that multiple notes can, can be layered together to make music. Then multiple notes need to be played here too when we're teaching about, about the Christian life and about what is true in us. And so Peter is the rock, but he's also the stumbling stone. Yeah. Both of those are true at the same time. Yeah, and that's that's in in the contemporary culture that seems to be difficult for us to grasp. It is. It's it's I don't know if it's it's part of the fruit of what we've talked about in terms of the conflating of an American dream with yeah. the gospel. I, I I also think there's part of that in terms of how postmodernism has um, invited us to dismiss anything prior to what's recent, because mm -hmm. if it's not recent, it isn't relevant. Um, but as we, as we bring this to a close, um, if we could somehow find a way to comfortably admit that paradox, yeah, what would that in turn sound like as a collective and what would that look like for the body of Christ at large in relationships with the culture, a culture that says we always win, we're never wrong, da 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 da. What would that look like? I, I think it would look like bearing witness to the gospel. I okay. think it would look like our lives would start to have the shape of the cross, right? And the, the suffering would be the, the pain of coming to terms with, you know, I, I think w one of the things that is telling is what hurts you and how do you respond to what hurts you? 
And I think if what hurts you is for other people to know you're flawed, that's a bad sign. Right? I think what should hurt you is the realization that I've hidden my flaws in ways that have made the hurt continue. For other people. Right. Right. The for consequences. Other, what, what does this do to others that I have touched? Right. And not just what do my weaknesses do to others, but what does my pretensions to strength do yeah, to others? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Back to the point about the veil. When you pretend to be someone you're not, you're not the only one who pays the price for that. Right. And the, the more central your role is in ministering to the body, the more critical it is that you let people see your humanity. You tell your story. Now, I, don't, I think there's, you can share too much. Appropriate self-disclosure. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, you Appropriate can definitely share too much. Sure. But I think it's critical that we tell our stories truthfully, honestly, and that we own like Peter is doing in the gospel, telling Mark, listen, tell my tell story. Tell the story exactly tell it the way it happened. This is, this is what I did. Yeah. Beloved, as we close, um, I'm reminded, and I want to make pray a brief prayer, but I'm reminded that someone once said, intimacy is into me see. Learning how to be self-disclosing in an appropriate way takes a lot of courage. Because we live in a world where false images are around us all the time and where we're supposed to live up to these false images. And so we all end up wearing masks. And taking those masks off can be very painful and it can be very terrifying because we fear that if we take the mask off and let people see who we really are, they're going to be justified in why they reject us. When in actual fact, Jesus called us to become more human, and the way we become more human is to take up that cross. That cross doesn't mortify our core essence. That cross grounds us in our essence in Christ and makes us more human, more touchable, more real, more accessible, more lovable. So I want to pray that all of us would take our masks off. Father, I pray that in this season, genuine intimacy would begin to be practiced in a fresh way in all of our lives. Give us the courage to take off our masks and appropriately self-disclose so others can see Christ in us doing a work to bring us to wholeness and well-being. For their sakes, in Jesus' name, amen. 